and join us here today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules here. Um, the, there's been so much uh, bad news out there. Uh, I think we're all encouraged that next week uh, some of the world's leaders will meet in San Francisco, and that truly is a very important an exciting event. I would dare say, uh, for my part, and germane to our discussion here, that the meeting, which is uh, rumored still, but I think is likely to take place between Prime Minister Kishida and Xi Jinping, um, uh, I dare say, might even be more important than the meeting between President Biden and Xi Jinping. Uh, we, we can, we'll see what our speaker thinks. But it's, uh, you know, we look forward to that. This issue is of immense importance, that is China-Japan relations. Um, I strongly believe that if relations are peaceful between China and Japan, that that, that will uh, set the tone for the entire region and, and really can help the cause of world peace. So we've, uh, that, that is why I put a focus on China-Japan relations this semester, and this is the third a uh, lecture in a series. Previously, we heard uh, Sayo Saruta gave us a uh, Japanese perspective, and uh, Gui Yongtao from Beida uh, provided a Chinese perspective um, last week. So um, we save the best for last. Uh, so I'm so happy to welcome my uh, good friend, uh, Professor Mike Mochizuki, uh, up from Washington. And uh, it, it's not just thrilling because he is the premier expert on this subject. So I'm so glad he could come to Watson. And this is, I believe, his first time in this room, which is um, very striking to me. But he uh, is a Brown graduate. So that's uh, just a, a great thrill. And I think uh, I told him especially to make some time to share a bit of memories, uh, his memories uh, for you and his um, thoughts on the Brown experience to make sure that you uh, students can truly appreciate how, uh, you know, one of you out there today in uh, a, a couple of decades could be uh, uh, achieving things like Mike Mochizuki is. And, and when I say he's a leader, that you'll see it, it, it's absolutely the case. Um, let me uh, just describe him a little bit, if you'll permit. Um, although one thing I did want to say also was speaking of uh, great lights in the field, we just lost one. Uh, in this field in particular, and that is uh, Ezra Vogel. Um, and I just wanted to mention this book, uh, which I think is of epical importance. His, this is his last book, of course. He passed away, I think, in 2020, and we, um, it's a huge loss for us, but I really want, th this book came out in 2019. The title is uh, China and Japan Facing History. So, the, you know, if you're here, you're interested in this topic, uh, please come up afterward if you're not familiar with the book and, and uh, you, you want to read this book and take it very seriously. But let me tell you about uh, our guest, uh, Professor Moch Mochizuki. He holds the Japan-U.S. Relations Chair in memory of Gaston Seeger at the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. Dr. Mochizuki was director of the Seeger Center for Asian Studies from 2001 to 2005. He co-directs the Memory and Reconciliation in the Asia-Pacific Research and Policy Project of the Seeger Center. Now, previously, he was a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. And he was also co-director of the Center for Asia-Pacific Policy at RAND. And I know you know, we all know what RAND is. Um, and previously, he taught at University of Southern California and also at Yale. So uh, please join me in thanking uh, Professor Mochizuki for coming today, and I look forward to his remarks. Uh, th uh, thank you very much, uh, Lyle, uh, for the introduction and for inviting me uh, 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 to uh, be here uh, with all of you uh, to talk about uh, Sino-Japanese uh, relations. Uh, it really is a, a delight to be uh, back here at Brown University. I, I don't have many opportunities to uh, to come back to Brown. The last time I was here was in uh, 2022 uh, for my 50th uh, reunion, uh, so it's kind of hard to, to imagine. Uh, but if you do the math, you'll realize that I was uh, at Brown in a, a, a transformative period in Brown University from 1968 to 1972, and as a freshman, 
I participated uh, in the movement uh, led by our student body president, uh, Ira Magaziner, uh, to <laughs> convince uh, uh, the Brown University faculty that it was time to fundamentally overhaul the curriculum. And that became the, the new curriculum. Uh, and I think it's now called the open cur curriculum. Uh, uh, um, but, and you did uh, that as a freshman. That's incredible. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, it was great uh, to work with my uh, fellow students. And, and I remember uh, uh, forming uh, small groups of, of three uh, undergraduates doing one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with the faculty. And so then when the faculty uh, debated uh, and ultimately passed uh, the, the student formulated proposals, it was a, it was a great uh, victory. Uh, and I have to admit, it was a, an, a, uh, an embarrassment for the administration that was, uh, was, uh, 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 was very reluctant about this. And then the president of the university resigned uh, the, the year after. Uh, um, a rabble rabble. <laughs> yeah, yes. uh, and, and another reason why I'm, I'm uh, really honored to be here at the Waston Institute is that um, a contribution that uh, uh, Thomas Watson Jr. made to Brown University, which was the, uh, the fellowship known at the time as the Arnold Fellowship. Uh, and the Arnold Fellowship program started in 1964, and I think it ended in 2012. Uh, but it was given to, uh, I think, uh, three s seniors, graduating seniors, uh, uh, with a stipend uh, to go uh, overseas with no obligations, uh, basically uh, to see a part of the world that they were interested in and to do research. But it wasn't like you had to uh, follow your research agenda once you went to uh, the foreign country uh, you can explore and you might go out and do something else. Uh, and so uh, uh, you know, I was grateful that I was a recipient of that fellowship. And with that, I decided to uh, go back to the country uh, in which I was born, uh, Japan. And I came to the United States when I was seven years old, grew up in Texas. I'd never been to Japan. I spoke a little bit of Japanese at home, but really didn't know how to read Japanese. Uh, and it was that uh, trip to Japan uh, that really changed my uh, life. Uh, and, and so that's how I got into Japanese uh, studies. And then I'm also pleased that you mentioned uh, Ezra Vogel. Uh, he was uh, one of my uh, major mentors in, in graduate school. And um, I would not have gone into security studies. Uh, if it wasn't for Ezra Vogel. I mean, after I, I received my PhD from Harvard, um, it was a very bad job market. Uh, there were no jobs uh, in the comparative politics yeah. uh, of Japan. Uh, and uh, I was about ready to take a position somewhere where I would have to teach about every country in the world except Russia, uh, Soviet Union, uh, and the United States because there were faculty members uh, who had that covered. Uh, and uh, Ezra Vogel offered me a postdoc uh, for me to retool in the security uh, area. And so that's how I got into uh, security studies and looking at East Asian uh, studies. So um, I'm very grateful uh, uh, to Ezra Vogel. Well, uh, I had the chance to uh, watch uh, the uh, online streaming of the first two presenters in this series, uh, one by uh, my good friend, uh, Ms. Sayo Saduta, and I thought she did a terrific job of showing that there is a fundamental gap uh, between Japanese policy elites on how Japan should be much more forward-leaning in helping uh, to defend uh, Taiwan in cooperation uh, with the United States and the Japanese public uh, that was very much uh, opposed uh, to that. And that disconnect uh, is, is a fundamental problem uh, in uh, Japanese foreign policy making. And I thought uh, Professor Gui uh, of Beida, uh, Beijing University, uh, did a superb job of uh, talking about the fluctuations in Sino-Japanese uh, uh, relations. So we generally have the impression that Sino-Japanese relations are bad, 
uh, because of historical issues, because of geopolitical rivalry and, and economic frictions. Uh, but Professor Gui uh, reminded us uh, that there have been good times and there have been bad times, and it's, it's fluctuated. Uh, and he uh, talked about uh, various factors that explain those uh, fluctuations. And right before uh, the pandemic hit, Sino-Japanese relations were on the up and up. And then during the pandemic, they started to stall. And now we're back again in a period of, of, of tension. And, and this is why, as Lyle has said, uh, the uh, perspective meeting between Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Kishida in San Francisco is, is very, very uh, important. Now, I, I think uh, Lyle's expectation in putting me on the program was uh, to uh, provide an American perspective. Uh, <laughs> well. uh, and uh, and you know, I, I don't think my views are necessarily representative of the American foreign policy community, uh, but I thought uh, I should talk about how the United States factors in to uh, Sino-Japanese uh, uh, relations. And you know, when you just kind of uh, take a first crack at this uh, question, if you just follow a straight realist logic, you would say, well, you know, uh, you know, what is there to really examine uh, carefully? You know, you have the rise of China, uh, and you know, China's big, uh, uh, Japan's relative power has been declining uh, since the bursting of the bubble economy. And so uh, straight realist logic would tell you uh, that as a result of this power shift, uh, there will be closer U.S.-Japan uh, relations uh, to counter uh, China. And I think uh, that logic operates. Uh, but in reality, uh, the picture is a little bit more complicated uh, because it doesn't tell you in what way the U.S.-Japan alliance is getting closer, uh, should get uh, closer. Uh, and I, I believe it's important to examine that uh, because although U.S. and Japanese interests regarding China and regarding the Asia-Pacific region tend to generally converge for all sorts of obvious reasons. Uh, there are also differences in perspectives and priorities. And so the United States and Japan aren't identical. And there are, are substantial differences on key issues. And one is, of course, uh, a result of the geographic location of Japan. Uh, Japan is right next to China. The United States is much further away from China. Uh, if there is a conflict across the Taiwan Strait, then it will be Japan uh, that will face uh, a kind of a major kind of a, a mil military crisis at the start of, of such a conflict. So if there is a war uh, between China and Taiwan uh, next to Taiwan, uh, it will be Japan uh, that uh, faces the risk of uh, major devastation uh, from this conflict. And then, you know, there are differences about uh, ideology. I think U.S. foreign policy is often driven uh, by ideological concerns. The Japanese foreign policy is, is much less driven uh, by ideological concerns. Also, uh, for Japan, uh, the importance of the Chinese economy to Japan's economy is probably much greater uh, than the importance of China to the U.S. economy, although I, th I think it's, it's quite important for the U.S. Uh, 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 community, uh, e economy. And then uh, in terms of history, and, and Ezra Vogel's book uh, does a brilliant job of this, uh, the, the long, deep historical cultural relationship between Japan and China uh, uh, gives uh, Sino-Japanese relations uh, uh, a, a different kind of flavor compared to uh, U.S.-China relations. And so uh, it's, imp it's important to kind of unpack exactly you know, uh, in what way the U.S.-Japan relationship, the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance, 
uh, should be strengthened and is being uh, strengthened. Now, over the last year or so, I, I've been fixated on a particular puzzle. Uh, you know, given uh, that uh, Japan uh, faces kind of enormous risks uh, from a possible conflict uh, over the Taiwan Strait, uh, and given the fact that uh, U.S.-China relations are uh, now in a period of intense competition, if not rivalry, uh, and for domestic political reasons, uh, in both China and the United States, the two countries may have great difficulty establishing uh, what Kevin Rudd calls guardrails in this rivalry uh, to avoid confrontation. Why isn't uh, Japan doing more uh, to try to prevent uh, this rivalry from uh, spinning out of control? Uh, and uh, why doesn't Japan uh, avoid uh, the risk of entrapment? So, so that's uh, been my kind of obsession uh, uh, <laughs> over the last uh, year or so. And uh, in addressing uh, that question, I uh, turn to, uh, I think, one of the, the leading lights of, uh, of uh, political science in terms of understanding alliance uh, politics. Uh, Glenn Schneider, who wrote a, an excellent World Politics article as well as uh, a book uh, on alliance uh, politics. And he's often known for uh, this notion of an alliance dilemma. You, know, you have allies uh, who have slightly different interests and priorities, uh, and uh, alliances uh, face this dilemma uh, between uh, entrapment on the one hand and abandonment on the other hand. Now, the, uh, what's often forgotten is that Glenn Schneider talked about two simultaneous security dilemmas. So one is this alliance security dilemma that I've just talked about, entrapment versus abandonment. And so allies will try to avoid abandonment or entrapment by the other ally. But the other is what he called the adversarial security dilemma, you know, which is the common notion of the security dilemma when a country does something to enhance their security, it leads to a response uh, by uh, the potential adversary uh, to uh, protect its security, and then the outcome of this interaction is that uh, both sides become uh, more uh, insecure. And I think it's important to think about the alliance security dilemma between entrapment and abandonment simultaneously uh, with uh, the implications it has for the adversarial security uh, dilemma. So if an ally is uh, concerned uh, about abandonment uh, on any particular uh, issue that it holds dear, uh, then the remedy for that is to strengthen the alliance relationship and to uh, prevent uh, the, your ally from ab abandoning you. And this makes a lot of sense. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, while maybe solving the problem of, of abandonment, uh, you may then exacerbate uh, the adversarial security uh, dilemma. And in many ways, that's exactly uh, uh, what is uh, happening today. Uh, and then the other is that if you're afraid of entrapment by your ally, then you would want to loosen the alliance relationship. Uh, and then the danger there is that uh, the potential adversary can drive a wedge. And so it's really hard to uh, come up with an, an optimal uh, solution to this. Uh, you know, the, probably the optimal solution is in, in a trilateral uh, game. All three countries uh, have good bilateral relations with each other. But uh, in history, uh, uh, and as in love, triangles are very hard to, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, to, to manage. And, and so... Um, you know, why is Japan, I think, increasingly getting entrapped 
in the U.S.-China rivalry. Uh, and my tentative answer to th this is, is twofold. Uh, one uh, is uh, what I would call uh, the Japanese fear of abandonment syndrome. Uh, the Japanese fear of abandonment syndrome. And then the second is the tenuous nature of the consensus <laughs> regarding Taiwan in both the United States and Japan. And the two kind of work together uh, uh, in creating this kind of situation of potential entrapment. So um, why do the Japanese, or, and here I'm talking about foreign policy elites, diplomats, politicians, uh, people who work in the defense community, uh, why do they have this fear, this fixation, this obsession with the fear of abandonment by the, the United States? And there are many reasons for this. It's a kind of a cumulative kind of explanation. And when I talk with uh, Japanese political elites, they often uh, uh, refer to uh, U.S. isolationist policies in the past. I mean, I, I don't necessarily agree with that because I think the United States uh, was very much involved in economic uh, engagement uh, in Asia. It just, uh, during the so-called uh, isolationist period, the United States did not want to get militarily involved uh, in Asia. But the Japanese really harp on that, that uh, in, somewhere in, Japan, in American DNA, there is this isolationist streak, and the Japanese need to be uh, 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 wary of that. And then uh, that general view of uh, America's foreign policy tradition has been kind of reconfirmed for the Japanese uh, over uh, decades. And you know, one uh, seminal event were the so-called Nixon shocks uh, that the United States could actually uh, pull the rug uh, from under uh, Japan uh, regarding China policy. Uh, and then also uh, what's known as the Guam Doctrine or the Nixon Doctrine that basically uh, uh, sent a message uh, to Asian allies uh, that they need to take responsibility for their own defense. I mean, don't necessarily count on the United States. And then after the end of the Cold War, uh, in the George H.W. Bush administration, Bush Sr., uh, there was an effort to cash in the, the peace dividend with the end of the Cold War uh, in Asia, and they started uh, this initiative called the East Asia Strategic Initiative, EASY. And this was a, uh, a plan to phase down the U.S. military presence uh, in East Asia. You know, now that peace is breaking out, uh, why did the United States need so many forces out uh, for deployed in East uh, Asia? And this sent major concerns uh, in Japan that the United States was abandoning uh, uh, Japan and its Asian allies. And so when the Clinton administration came in, uh, the United States and Japan were locked in a, you know, a trade war uh, and the security relationship uh, was, uh, seemed to be in tatters. Uh, they love the fact that the new Assistant Secretary of Defense, Joseph Nye, a professor at Harvard, came up with the Nye Initiative and said, no, we value the alliances and we've stopped the drawdown uh, from Asia. Uh, there will be 100,000 U.S. troops in Asia and 50,000 of them would be in uh, Japan. And then another uh, crisis point uh, was the Persian Gulf crisis and war of 1990 and 91, and the Japanese uh, did not meet some of the expectations of American policymakers of helping uh, the coalition of, of the willing to go after uh, Iraq, after Iraq invaded uh, Kuwait. And this uh, was a huge crisis in the Japanese security community. 
And after uh, this series of, of uh, uh, events, the Japanese thought they needed to avoid the abandonment, or they need to deal with the possibility of U.S. abandonment. And the interesting thing is that you know, I mean, there are kind of two logical choices uh, uh, to deal with the abandonment problem. One is for Japan to become more self-reliant uh, as a security actor. Uh, some might even say Japan developed nuclear weapons. Uh, but that was a non-starter from a domestic politics uh, point of view. I mean, there were some who uh, advocated uh, uh, a Japanese version of Gaulism, but that got very little attra uh, attraction uh, in the Japanese polity. So the, the choice that the foreign policy community uh, made was that in order to avoid abandonment, Japan needed to be a better ally of the United States, to do more for the common defense between the United States and Japan, and to strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance relationship uh, and uh, to modernize uh, its defense forces in such a way that the United States would say, well, the uh, Japan is a major security partner. And so uh, quite apart from the China issue, uh, uh, this uh, happened over a span of multiple decades. And you saw this again uh, in another fear of abandonment with the arrival of President Trump. And again, uh, the Japanese went all in uh, in uh, supporting the U.S.-Japan alliance. And uh, um, Prime Minister Abe even reinterpreted uh, the Constitution. Uh, so that Japan could begin to move into the realm of collective uh, defense. Now, given the pacifist culture in Japan, one wonders how could the foreign policy elites get away with this? I mean, there were many that thought that this all went against uh, Article 9. And uh, I think one of the major reasons for uh, the Japanese um, public's uh, consent, if not embrace, of this direction uh, was the China threat, was the China threat. Uh, and it was a negative view of China. Uh, and um, what I have here is, is a graph uh, uh, of polls conducted uh, by a NGO called uh, Gendon MPO, which is like public opinion. Uh, nonprofit organization, but there are also public opinion polls conducted by the Jap Japanese government, and, and I don't have a slide uh, here, but uh, at the time of the 1978 Peace and Friendship Treaty between Japan and China, uh, about 80 percent of the Japanese had a favorable impression of China. It was up there with the favorable impression of the United States. In fact, I think uh, more Japanese had a favorable impression of China <laughs> than a favorable impression of the United States. And so when you look at uh, this multi-decade process, what happened is that the Japanese became increasingly negative uh, about uh, China uh, for a variety of reasons. And this graph is interesting because in recent years, you know, before COVID, uh, you know, despite all of the horrible things that Japan might have done or did do against China, uh, the aggression, the atrocities, the Chinese people were warming up to the Japanese. Uh, but uh, the Japanese became increasingly negative. And so although I think Essentially, the Japanese are still uh, pretty much a pacifist uh, nation uh, that uh, they kind of consented, acquiesced to the strengthening of the U.S.-Japan uh, um, uh, alliance. Now, uh, you know, one, one might think that there is also kind of an entrapment issue, uh, and one entrapment issue for 
the United States is the territorial dispute between Japan and China. And that's regarding the Senkaku uh, Islands, uh, and the Chinese call it uh, the Daoyu uh, Islands. Uh, these are uninhabited rocks. Uh, and if you follow uh, uh, the Permanent Court of Arbitration uh, decision uh, in the case between the Philippines and China, uh, the Senkaku Islands do not deserve an exclusive economic zone. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are uninhabited islands, but the Japanese really, really care about these islands. Uh, and so from the American point of view, you know, one would wonder, well, why should the United States risk a war with a nuclear power like China to defend these islands and rocks, uh, uh, rocks. rocks. defend <laughs> these these rocks, uh, uninhabited uh, rocks, uh, and you know I'm not sure the United States ought to do that, but the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty seems to obligate that because th those islands are administered by uh, Japan. Uh, and so you would think that the, the Americans would be uh, worried about entrapment. But the interesting thing is that the United States has not become so worried about entrapment. Uh, in fact, uh, they s have used this territorial dispute in a sense to mobilize the Japanese public and the foreign policy elites to tighten up the alliance relationship with uh, the United States. And, you know, when uh, Gendon MPO asked Japanese, you know, if you don't like the, uh, have an unfavorable impression of the Chinese, what's the reason? And the number one reason is the territorial uh, disputes. Uh, now, uh, the United States also is concerned about Japanese abandonment. And, and the United States was concerned about this from, from uh, the early days of the Cold War because the Japanese wanted to normalize relations with the People's Republic of China uh, and, was, and, and uh, Japan wanted to normalize relations with the Soviet Union. But the United States wanted to make sure that Japan was on the U.S. side in the Cold War divide and in the end, through kind of domestic political interference, uh, the Japanese uh, aligned with, with the United States. Another period of possible abandonment, and I think it, it was not a case of abandonment, but uh, American policymakers saw this as a case of possible abandonment, and this was in 2009 during the administration of Prime Minister Yukio Hatoyama. Uh, and he talked about an East Asian community, uh, and he proposed that the Sino-Japanese relationship should become rock solid, sort of like the French and German relationship, and that would be the pillar of stability uh, in East Asia. And the Obama administration, unfortunately, viewed this as a dangerous thing and uh, uh, basically uh, put pressure uh, on Japan and uh, Prime Minister Hat uh, contributed to uh, the collapse of the Hatoyama uh, government. So uh, although there, there may be uh, concerns about entrapment, uh, in the end there was a focus on avoiding abandonment. Uh, it was kind of an obsession with that, especially on the Japanese side, but to some extent on the U.S. side, and this has uh, led the U.S.-Japan alliance to become tighter, uh, and uh, because there's less concern about the entrapment, uh, we, we uh, have this problem, this danger of entrapment. Uh, and. Uh, let me just uh, turn uh, uh, very quickly to the Taiwan issue, and, and um, I won't be able to do justice to this complicated uh, topic. Uh, but you've all heard about the, the one China policy of the United States, and these joint statements are basically the pillars 
of the, the U.S. One China policy. Uh, but uh, although the Nixon administration and the Carter administration really pushed this line, and, and even though Ronald Reagan uh, kind of embraced the 1982 communique as part of the One China policy, there was never unanimity in the United States on behalf of that. Uh, and one uh, evidence of this uh, is the Taiwan Relations Act uh, that uh, Congress uh, passed uh, a few months after uh, the normalization of relations between the United States and, Ch and China on January 1979. And now in terms of the, of the definition of the One China policy, we now refer to the Taiwan Relations Act in addition to uh, uh, the three communiques, and also uh, a secret kind of, a uh, well, a secret memo to Taiwan called the Six Assurances. So it just shows you that although the United States has been committed uh, as a declaratory policy to one China, uh, there's never been unanimity uh, for this. And the story that we see today is, is kind of an effort to dilute uh, the statements uh, of the three communiques. But what about the Japanese case? Well, uh, this is the communique of normalization between Japan and China. And so Japan and China was able to fully normalize relations before the United States. The United States did not do this until 1979 because of the Taiwan question. It's very hard to cut off the ties with the Republic of China on Taiwan. But the Japanese, after Nixon's trip to Beijing, thought that it was free to basically cut off the official diplomatic ties with the Republic of China. But one major issue was the status of Taiwan. Uh, and China insisted that the Japanese recognize that Taiwan was part of China uh, and part of the People's Republic of, of China. Uh, and the Japanese balked at that because there was a strong constituency in Japan that was pro-Taiwan. And so they fudged this. And the fudging was this uh, strange reference uh, to the Cairo Declaration and the Potsdam Declaration. And I'm not going to go into the details of this, but the basic idea is that Japan, under the Potsdam Declaration, was obligated to return Taiwan to China. But the question is, what China? And at the time, it was the Republic of China. Uh, and, but by putting this in, the Chinese were reassured that Japan was not pursuing a one China, one Taiwan policy, or a uh, two China uh, policy. Uh, and uh, Zhou Enlai basically ex ex accept this uh, compromise, although China's position was that it wanted Japan to recognize that Taiwan was part of China. And the only thing that Japan says is that it acknowledges and respects uh, this. Now, the interesting thing is that, you know, I, I always wondered why China agreed to this. Uh, and... Uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not a historian, so I don't do much archival research, but I was just kind of looking around the Wilson Center uh, Cold War History Project archives, uh, and uh, I mean, they've done a great job of using the Japanese equivalent of the foreign, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what is Freedom of, of, of Information Act. There's, a, mm -hmm. there's now a version of this in, in Japan. And... They managed to declassify this document. And it was kind of uh, mind-blowing to me uh, uh, because this was written uh, by a high official in the Japanese government that played a role in Sino-Japanese normalizations. And here is the, um, uh, the translation of this. And uh, basically, uh, it says that Taiwan 
is a domestic issue of China. Uh, so uh, there's a tacit agreement, although the formal agreement, uh, Japan did not embrace uh, what the Chinese wanted. Privately, they did. And this was done by Foreign Minister Ohida. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's not only a domestic issue, there, there's a kind of uh, a possibility that China would actually liberate Taiwan. Uh, and in that case, what the Japanese were concerned with was the property of the Japanese uh, in Taiwan. So, you know, this is really uh, secretly the Japanese have embraced the Chinese position. Uh, and this uh, uh, document uh, was uh, kind of sec kept secret and, uh, you know, um, you know, it's just amazing that the Wilson Center uh, un uncovered uh, 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 this. Now, what this shows is that in Japan, too, there was a lot of opposition to normalization. And there are forces in Japan that wanted to embrace kind of an independent Taiwan. And so now we have this kind of tug of war in the United States as well as in uh, Japan. And so then let me uh, just go, um, let's see if I can, uh, I'll skip through this. Um, and um, I was looking at the way the United States and Japan now describe their policy towards Taiwan. And so these are authoritative documents because they are part of the national security strategy. And this is what the United States uh, said and uh, wrote in October 2022 under the Biden administration. And so you see the references to the various documents. And the interesting thing is that our One China policy, uh, it's the uh, Taiwan Relations Act comes first. The, the joint communiques and the sex assurances. But the interesting thing is, is we oppose any unilateral changes to the status quo from either side and, and do not support Taiwan independence. So the United States explicitly states uh, uh, the United States does not support the independence of Taiwan. This is the Japanese characterization of their policy towards Taiwan. Uh, there is, first of all, there's no mention of a one China policy. In Japan, you don't talk about a one China policy. You talk about the 1972 uh, communique, uh, and it talks about all of the, the good things about the relationship with Taiwan, you know, which is good. I'm very sympathetic to that. Uh, but there is no explicit reassurance to China that Japan does not support the independence of Taiwan or does not support kind of unilateral changes on either side uh, of the uh, status quo. A former foreign minister of the Democratic Party asked Prime Minister Kishida, why doesn't Japan give the same kind of reassurance that the United States gave about not supporting the independence of Taiwan? Uh, and Kishida ducked the question and just said, we abide by the 1972 communique. Uh, and um, you know, I, I asked uh, a former deputy foreign minister of Japan why doesn't Japan do this? You know, this, the Americans have done this. Uh, but why doesn't the Japanese government say this? I mean, it just seems like it's kind of a minimal in terms of credible assurance about a one China policy. And the answer I got is, Mike, uh, that would be political suicide. <laughs> that would be political suicide. And I said, was well, it because uh, there are major groups in Japan, Japan that favor the independence of Taiwan? So, so we're now in this kind of odd situation where there might be a dilution of, uh, of kind of the one China policy of the United States, but also a kind of a characterization of Japanese policy, which is 
not very reassuring towards the, the Chinese. And so in a sense, uh, Japan's position on Taiwan has become, has evolved in such a direction uh, that in a sense it reinforces rather than checks uh, the, uh, the kind of American direction of diluting uh, the one China policy. Uh, so, th you know, this is what I find uh, alarming with what is happening in Sino-Japanese relations. And uh, one reason is this focus on avoiding uh, abandonment and not paying much attention to uh, uh, entrapment. Uh, uh, and the other uh, is uh, the kind of collapse of the normalization consensus uh, that existed uh, in uh, Japan during the 1970s, which is the foundation uh, of, of stability. Uh, finally, uh, I'll just end here uh, with uh, a, a promotion, uh, is that, you know, is there a way out of this entrapment? And one way out is for Japan uh, to be a leading middle power and to promote uh, middle power diplomacy, because all of the middle powers in the Asia Pacific share a common interest that they want to avoid war and they don't want a divided Asia Pacific region. And Japan has a huge stake in that. So does South Korea, so do the countries of, of Southeast Asia, so does Australia and New Zealand. So this is not the formation of an anti American coalition. Uh, but it is a way of trying to mitigate the U.S.-China rivalry to avoid a war. And I think Japan uh, uh, kind of has a responsibility uh, to pursue that. And uh, I was part of a research group in Japan uh, called the Asia's Future Research Group. Uh, almost all of the members are Japanese. I'm the only American in this group. Uh, and uh, this report lays out in, in details a 78-page report in terms of what uh, a middle power diplomacy would look like to avoid being entrapped in U.S.-China strategic rivalry. So let me stop here. Okay, well, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, you've set a very full table for us, Mike, and I, I think I could listen to another two or three hours of lecture no, no, here. No, you don't. <laughs> well, and we, I will say, um, you know, I, I certainly have enough questions to go till 1.30 and beyond, but if I understand, you know, people have class and whatnot, so please uh, feel free to uh, depart as you need. But, and I hope you will, uh, though, pitch some questions, though, before you do go. Um, I've got about a hundred, so <laughs> let me. I'll, I'll dive in while you're you're all thinking of your questions. But um, you know, you you spoke quite a bit about history, and I I really think you know, <laughs> I think I, I feel quite strongly. America seems to be these days like an ahistorical society. So it's almost like shocking when somebody wants to talk about history and talk about documents, and and uh, I find that you know that that is quite a stunning uh, revelation there that you found in the archives. Uh, I want to ask you about another historical moment, which seems to be incredibly important. Um, but and I, I had previously really only heard rumors of it, but you you did mention it, uh, and that is the. Uh, it seems the United States played a role in the downfall of uh, Prime Minister Hatayama. I mean that, in retrospect, that does seem to be qu quite an amazing uh, moment and set of circumstances. I wonder, can you? Can you tell us a little more about what you, you know about that? I, I had kind of heard rumors of it, but I didn't. Yeah, yeah. You know. well, well, you know, it's, it's not a, a kind of a direct uh, uh, political uh, intervention uh, to uh, lead to the collapse of the Hatoyama government. Uh, but one of the major platforms of the Hatoyama government uh, was to revise the base realignment agreement between the United States and Japan uh, regarding Okinawa. Uh, and uh, the agreement was to shut down uh, a very dangerous Marine Corps air station right in the middle of an urban area. Uh, and this was a promise that the United States made in 1996. It would be returned in seven years. That was 2003. It's still there. Uh, uh, and the condition was that 
an alternate facility be built in Okinawa. And the people of Okinawa were against that. Uh, you know, they wanted a reduction of, of the U.S. military uh, uh, presence. And so when Prime Minister Hatoyama uh, wins a landslide victory, uh, becoming uh, uh, the, the first opposition uh, party member to win uh, a majority mandate in Japan, one of his platforms was to revise that plan and to move the base outside of Okinawa. Uh, and the United States stonewalled him on that. And I tried to discover, you know, you know why uh, was there this fixation on this base issue? And in my interviews with some of the people who were actually involved in the Obama administration, uh, was that uh, if we give in to Hatoyama on this particular issue, then that would support Hatoyama's strategic shift in a direction uh, that was more like Mahathir of creating an exclusive East Asian community and uh, shutting out the United States. Um, and if true, uh, you know, that, that might be understandable. So uh, I, I know uh, former Prime Minister Hatoyama uh, uh, very well, uh, and uh, I, I conducted several interviews with him and asked him about that. And he said, there's no way I was interested in excluding the United States. He says, Mike, you should just go to my first press conference after I became Prime Minister and I was asked this question and I said, I cannot imagine an East Asian community without the United States. Uh, and so there was a complete intelligence failure on the part of the Obama administration. Hmm. Uh, and so the United States stonewalled the, uh, the Japanese on the Okinawa issue, which then uh, led to the rise of a conservative kind of criticism of Hatoyama and his public opinion uh, ratings started to plummet. Uh, and uh, he ended up uh, 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 resigning. So, so that's kind of uh, uh, the story. And, and you can get this, uh, I mean, th this is not secret, you can get the American attitude by reading uh, the late Jeff Bader's book, Obama's China, yeah. uh, where he states, and he was, I think, you know, I've had many conversations with Jeff about this, and I told him he was absolutely wrong on this point, uh, but he insisted that Hatoyama was trying to move in a direction towards China uh, at the expense of the United States. Uh, uh, but uh, Prime Minister Hatoyama's view was that Sino-Japanese relations and Japan ROK relations had been fraught uh, with tensions because of the historical issue, and what he wanted to do was to promote a sense of community among these three countries, and that would be the foundation of stability in the region. So there was a complete misinterpretation, and again, this is because of the American obsession with the fear of abandonment. Wow, that I think that is uh, very interesting, and um, one has to wonder what you know how history might have turned out differently if uh, the Obama administration had taken a different approach. Um, okay, like I said, I got a, about a hundred more questions, but I I think I would like to uh, see if our students and and uh, faculty and have have some questions for Professor Mochizuki. So uh, we have a, um, a microphone here we can pass around, but. Uh, Okay, yes, in the back there, yes. Hi, thank you. Um, it's interesting you mentioned uh, Glenn, Glenn Schneider, but if I'm uh, understanding his work correctly, um, great powers only worry about entrapment and not abandonment, and small powers worry about abandonment as opposed to entrapment. So I'm wondering, like, uh, uh, maybe I, I, like, I missed this part in your speech, but uh, why uh, is this often not the case with regard to the the uh, Japanese U.S. relationship? Yeah, Thank yeah. You. So uh, uh, I, I know um, uh, uh, Glenn Schneider makes that uh, uh, assertion, uh, uh, but I'm not necessarily sure that that's true, uh, uh, and that I think under certain mm -hmm. circumstances, uh, great powers uh, do fear uh, kind of the uh, abandonment. Uh, and then other times uh, entrapment. Uh, and then a lot of his analysis is very much 
uh, you know, within uh, kind of a bipolar Cold War, uh, where, where uh, this alliance dilemma, he thinks, uh, is not as serious. Uh, uh, but uh, again, you know, I, I, I uh, would disagree somewhat uh, with how constraining the bipolar system was, that even within the bipolar system there are cases in which allies uh, disagree and, and there may be concerns about entrapment or, or abandonment. Okay, yeah, great question. I see a lot of hands up and that's great. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I think um, because I'm not in the um, uh, special field you're in, so this concept of uh, middle, it's called middle powers, uh, countries. Um, I think it's a fascinating. I'm not sure whether it's new, but uh, based on your judgment, what kind of role this policy report will play in Japan's foreign policy moving forward? Yeah. 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 So, uh, well, thanks, thanks for that, that question. So, uh, you know, first of all, um, we released this report uh, in July of this year. Uh, in in Okinawa and in Tokyo and then in, in Osaka and we had press conferences and it was interesting that uh, many f focused their criticism on this whole notion of middle power uh, and, uh, 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 and and for various reasons uh, uh, you know one is that you know some resented uh, calling Japan a middle power. He says, well, Japan's more than a middle power. And I said, well, is Japan a great power? No. He said, but we're a major power. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, w when I talk to my Korean friends, they like the middle power uh, concept because, uh, you know, they want South Korea to have the status of a middle power. Uh, as, as, so, so that was interesting. Uh, the, the other reason is, you know, I think it's somewhat justified is that, you know, this was a policy report and not an academic paper. And so we didn't have like a two-page uh, definition and analysis of what the middle power concept uh, was. But, uh, but, but there, uh, uh, and um, I, maybe we should have. But uh, our notion of middle power is not so much wedded towards necessary power capabilities, but it's a, it's a kind of behavior. So, uh, so middle powers have to have a certain amount of capability. Most of these are advanced industrial uh, states. So uh, you know, they're, they're not uh, developing states. So they have a certain amount of uh, 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 capability. Uh, but uh, their behavior is to avoid as much as possible unilateral action and the use of force and to seek cooperative ways of dealing uh, with uh, international issues and challenges and use kind of multilateral approaches. So it's a style of behavior. And so, you know, one can ask, why well, Singapore a middle power? Uh, well, uh, you know, power capabilities, you know, it's a city state, you know, it's a small power, but uh, it, it certainly takes a, a view that is consistent uh, with the middle power. So, th so that's what we had in mind. Now, to, to what extent did our report resonate? Well, uh, if you read the report, uh, it, uh, it starts with a full, uh, unrestrained criticism of the new national security strategy of Japan. I mean, we just think that it's misguided. And so uh, my friends in government who were responsible for uh, 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 drafting this, I mean, they're not happy uh, with, this, uh, with this result. Uh, but. Uh, and, and those that liked the report were, were some of the moderates in the opposition party, but uh, there were some opposition party members, like the Constitutional Democratic uh, Party members, who didn't like the part that we basically say Japan needs military deterrence. And we're, we're not saying that Japan should, should disarm. Uh, uh, Japan needs to have military deterrence and needs to be smart about that and should stick to a defensive uh, def uh, denial military uh, doctrine. But some of the pastor says, well, you know, we don't want any deterrence. You know, we, uh, we want to lower uh, uh, the defense expenditures. But the other thing is that there were some moderates in the LDP who agreed with us. Uh, but the thing is, is that it's the same in, in the United States is that the discourse is such 
that it's very hard to articulate and support publicly an alternative. Uh, and so that was one of the reasons why we uh, created this group, because we thought if, if we could uh, bring the group together, uh, there would be a sort of force in numbers, because if any one person advocated uh, this, then they yeah. might be ostracized. Uh, and so, uh, you know, so far, uh, I can't say that we've moved the needle, uh, but I, I hope that uh, uh, th there will be an alternative view that's there. I mean, one of the things that I fear in both the United States and Japan is this phenomenon called the tyranny of consensus. I, uh, you know, my good friend Jan N Nolan, uh, who passed away a few years ago, wrote a terrific book about the tyranny of consensus. And I think that's what we have in both the United States and Japan. And so what we're trying to do with this report is to say, well, you know, uh, there is a dissenting voice. Uh, it's, not a, it's, a, it's not a radical dissent. I mean, we see our proposals as being more moderate and more realistic. And we see that the Japan's new national security strategy uh, is dangerous and is totally unrealistic. Yes. Okay. So, yes, sir, in the back, and then we'll come back to this side. Hi. Thank you for this talk, first of all. Um, earlier when you mentioned that uh, the Japanese constituency, a large part of it favors a pro-Taiwan stance, uh, I was very fascinated. And if we combine that with like how the Japanese popular opinion on historical events like Japanese atrocities during World War II in China, how that's very at odds with what Chinese people think, um, do you see that these things are uh, like an irremovable, I guess, wedge between China-Japan relations. Are, is this something that can be resolved going forward to have uh, to result in good China-Japan relations? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so th thanks very much uh, for for this question, and you know, this this has been another one of my obsessions, uh, and I, I think it's possible, uh, but I think uh, there there are kind of uh, two problems. One is that it's a myth that the Japanese do not recognize aggression and atrocities committed towards China. Uh, the reality is that Japan is very divided on this. That uh, I, w I would say most Japanese tend to recognize that Japan launched a war of aggression against China. And most Japanese acknowledge that uh, Japan committed atrocities in China and other parts of Asia. Now, there are maybe disagreements about how extensive those atrocities were uh, and whether or not only Japan was responsible for the aggression, but there's an acknowledgment of that. But there are those in the right wing who actually deny those things. And what has happened over time, and this is also an artifact of U.S.-Japan relations, is that because the United States wants to mobilize Japan as a security partner, uh, it has cooperated uh, and acquiesced to the right wing because they're the ones that promote this. And therefore, the kind of voice of the right wing uh, in numbers may be small, but the, the, num uh, the effect and the impression on the Chinese may be much, much greater. So that's one part of the problem. But, but, I, but I, I, I think it's possible to develop kind of a consensus uh, that, that would be more harmonious with the Chinese view. The other part is the Chinese side, the problem on the Chinese side. Uh, and this is an artifact of patriotic education. And you know, every country engages in patriotic uh, education. Uh, but the Chinese version of the patriotic education in the end ends up uh, characterizing Japan as the enemy without recognition of the transformation that Japan has made after the end of World War II. And so I, I am stunned uh, every time I talk to my Chinese students about 
uh, what they learned about Japan uh, and today's Japan, and it's only after coming to the United States that they're aware. Uh, and so uh, the, the problem of Sino-Japanese historical reconciliation is a problem not just of the, of the Japanese, and uh, certainly the, uh, Japan needs to do more, but it's also a problem uh, on the Chinese side. Now on the Taiwan issue, I should just note that uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that Taiwan has reconciled with Japan's colonial past. Uh, and, and in fact, it's, it's a very positive view. Uh, and it's always been puzzling, but one of my students did a paper on this. And the reason is, is that uh, a after the liberation of Taiwan, uh, the nationalists came in and imposed major repressive measures. And so many of the people of Taiwan are much more resentful of the nationalists yeah. uh, than the Japanese that thought the Japanese were more, uh, more humane. Uh, so, so that's kind of an irony of, of history. Uh, Mike, can I just two finger on the history issue for one moment? I uh, have some experience considering uh, Germany's view of history, and I know the two are often compared. Have you have you reflected on that comparison, or what, yeah, yeah, any yeah, thought and, on that? And and and, and uh, my bottom line in this is that uh, it's a non-starter for Japan. Uh, and, and this is the question I always get asked by Koreans and Chinese, you know, why can't Japan be like Germany? And the answer that the Japanese would give is that despite the aggression and the atrocities that Japan committed, uh, Japan was not Nazi Germany. That Japan uh, did not commit the atrocities because there was a, uh, a conspiracy to wipe out a ethnic group. And they would uh, say, yes, the Holocaust was a singular event. And, and so the unfortunate thing, in their view, was that the Nuremberg trial was applied to Tokyo, uh, and it was misguided. So even those in the progressives would resent uh, the analogy of Nazi Germany mm. uh, to imperial uh, Japan. And so, so there's a kind of, a, I think, a, a real divide in perception between Japanese uh, and and uh, Westerners on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's. Uh, yeah, uh, Bill, go ahead. Uh, can we get the microphone there? Uh, yeah. A great talk. Uh, on the, your creation of the middle power, Asian and the organizations, it seems to me kind of analogous to the uh, to the strategic organization of the EU. You, you think that Japan could act like Germany, you know, in, in the middle power organizations like uh, Ger you know, Germany EU? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well uh, yes. Uh, well, that's what I hope. W whether it will, uh, I, I don't know, uh, but it should. Uh, and uh, you know, so, so, so one of the appalling things, uh, or in fact, this is the, uh, what what caused uh, uh, the light bulb to to. to uh, to, to go off in my head, uh, is uh, uh, during the second Persian Gulf War, uh, the, the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, and uh, one of my good friends who uh, was a major advisor of Prime Minister Abe uh, kind of led many of the study groups for the Prime Minister on Japanese grand strategy. Uh, he uh, wrote uh, in a Japanese newspaper, uh, this, uh, this thing is that, it, uh, if I were an American, I would oppose the U.S. invasion of Iraq. But I'm Japanese, and therefore I support it. Uh, uh, basically because he felt that the U.S.-Japan alliance was so important that even though he disagreed with the policy, uh, uh, Japan has no choice but to support the United States. And uh, I wrote a piece about this, and, and I said, well, France and Germany opposed the U.S. invasion against Iraq. It did not have the imprimatur of the United Nations. And so if Japan had also joined that, the U.S.-Japan alliance would have survived, Many in the United States would have said, we understand the Japanese position. But 
Japan's reluctance to do this is because of this fear of abandonment. If Japan does not follow the United States, the United States is going to get angry and cut off the, uh, Japan. Uh, and I don't think that that's true. I mean, in fact, today, if, if Japan said, uh, wait a minute, uh, you know, uh, don't ramp up the tensions uh, regarding Taiwan, the United States is not going to say, we're going to pack up uh, and leave Japan. It's not going to abandon Japan because the United States needs Japan more than ever before. Uh, and so if they can get over this abandonment syndrome, then I think Japan could really uh, uh, kind of move in, in the middle power. And, and this was exactly the vision uh, that Prime Minister Hatoyama had. Uh, and that's the notion of the East Asian community. In fact, in his first press conference, he said, let's look at Europe. You know, you had the European community and, and uh, Franco-German uh, relations was fundamental for stability. Uh, we should learn from that and think about this uh, in the Asian case. Um, I feel like we haven't quite, um, you've talked a lot about Taiwan, but you haven't really spelled out for us your, how you think it would really go down. You know, what, how do you think, uh, and, and I mean, that's a, I know it's a very dark topic, and, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to raise it, but I do think we're, we're not doing the topic justice, especially yeah. since you've put it front and center in your, yeah, uh, your work. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I, so I, what I, would happen and what do you think should happen? Yeah, yeah well, I, I, I ran out of time, and, and so. Yeah, sorry uh, about uh, that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah so, uh, I mean, I, I, I wrote an article, uh, you know, called uh, Tokyo's uh, Taiwan Conundrum, What Can Japan Do to Prevent uh, War? Yeah, Washington uh, Quarterly. Yeah, 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 so, I mean, that, that lays out in, in some detail uh, my thinking about this. And so Japan's in a conundrum uh, because uh, without Japan's support, and the minimal support is allowing U.S. military assets to be used to help defend Taiwan, uh, the United States cannot prevent uh, China from taking Taiwan. I mean, uh, th those bases are, are, are uh, incredibly important. Uh, and uh, China may have an incentive to actually strike those bases. Uh, and uh, there will be collateral damage of civilians being killed. And so uh, Japan is in this conundrum is that uh, if they tell the United States uh, you can't use those bases and we're going to be neutral, then the United States will think, well, what kind of ally is Japan? Uh, but then if Japan goes all in and says, we're, we're with the United States all the way, and we will not only allow U.S. forces to use bases, but also self-defense forces would be actually uh, involved in joint military operations with the United States to help defend Taiwan, then uh, I think this will lead to a crisis in Sino-Japanese relations. And, and, and so the middle ground is you know, what I try to carve out in this article, and uh, it's a combination of maintaining strategic ambiguity, so it's neither neutrality or strategic clarity, uh, and maintaining a defensive denial doctrine, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, a nuclear deterrence is, is a non-starter for the, the Japanese. Uh, and then there's this notion of, of offensive denial. Unfortunately, there are those in Japan or, who are increasingly interested in offensive uh, uh, denial. Uh, I think it's an unrealistic uh, strategy. Uh, and so uh, the Japanese position, uh, in my view, should be of maintaining strategic ambiguity. Uh, and defensive denial. But then, uh, when there is a crisis, what will actually happen? And it really depends on the context of the crisis. Uh, and so if it's not a, an attack out of the blue and it's the beginning of a crisis, I think Japan should exercise its leverage vis-a-vis uh, -vis both the United States and China to prevent the crisis from leading to a kinetic conflict. Mm -hmm. If it becomes a kinetic conflict, then the key question is whether China will attack U.S. military bases 
on Japan. If it does, then Japan can begin to use force under the right of individual self-defense from a defensive denial uh, uh, perspective. And, and that defensive denial could contribute to the defense of Taiwan. But there is also the possibility that China would want to drive a wedge between the United States and Japan and to, and to tell the Japanese, uh, we have no intention of striking at Japan uh, if you set out and if you do not allow the United States to use uh, its assets in a Taiwan contingency. And if China were to propose that, uh, it's kind of a yeah. subtle, not so subtle blackmail of the Japanese, then I think this will be a moment of truth for the J Japanese. And, and I can't say which way Japan will go. Uh, it depends on the leader, but it also depends on how they see who was responsible for the crisis. Was it Taiwan? Was it the United States? Uh, was it China? So it really depends on the context of the crisis. Okay. All right, folks, we've got a, a couple more minutes, so let's have a few more questions. Yeah. In the back there. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, and welcome back to Brown. Um, so I first want to ask about Taiwan as well. Um, so you mentioned uh, there's a, a considerable uh, group of people in, in Japan uh, supporting Taiwan independence. I think that's differentiates Japan from other middle powers you have in mind. So I guess my quick question is, uh, what are the major reasons that has been the case? Is it because, you know, historical reasons, you know, Taiwan's, you know, proximity to Japan or something else? And um, how do you think that would uh, impact the possibility of Japan being a middle power? The second question is about supply chains, which unfortunately I think uh, has being increasingly discussed in security terms and has really been a uh, focal point in uh, U.S.-China relations, especially export control. And there's been efforts to get Japan on board to, uh, to support U.S. efforts to, um, um, to limit the flow of advanced technologies to, to China. So my question is, uh, on that uh, supply chain um, you know, topic, do you think you know, it's more likely that Japan is going to be entrapped by this effort to contain China? Or is it possible that Japan can play some kind of middle power role by, you know, working with, you know, Netherlands, you know, Korea, for example, to maybe find a middle ground between U.S. and China? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, th uh, thanks for those questions. So first, uh, you know, I don't want to be misunderstood. Uh, I am not saying that the majority of the Japanese support the independence of Taiwan. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, there is a minority, uh, and uh, that minority is... Uh, quite vociferous, um, and, uh, 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 you know, it's quite, it's, 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 it's a, it's not a majority, but a very kind of powerful segment uh, of uh, the LDP. And therefore, for Prime Minister Kishida to say in the Diet, uh, Japan does not support uh, uh, the independence of Taiwan uh, would be political suicide. Uh, uh, because of this this uh, minority, uh, I think the majority view, and this is a wide majority, is they support the status quo. They support the status quo, and and and, and that essentially means that there's no war, uh, and Taiwan remains separate. Uh, now, it could be that that's de facto independence, uh, but it's this hope that China will be patient about this. Uh, and so over and over again, the Japanese will say, we don't expect that there will be a war, uh, because that, that's part of their talking points, that, that uh, you know, when the government is asked, well, what is Japan going to do uh, in terms of a war over Taiwan? The answer is, we don't expect a war over Taiwan, and therefore, <laughs> we don't want to answer this, this, this question. And the problem is, is that uh, the risk of war uh, is increasing. Uh, uh, so. Uh, they want to preserve the status quo, and why is that? And I don't think it's some nostalgia for the good old days of Japanese imperialism. Uh, I, I think it's a mix of a lot of factors. Uh, um, before normalization of relations with mainland China, uh, there, there continued to be uh, really close economic, so, uh, social ties between the people of, of Japan and the people of Taiwan. I think the Japanese, 
are very grateful for the fact that the people of Taiwan have not harped upon the history issue. Uh, so that's another uh, issue. And then I think it's increasingly uh, because Taiwan has become a vibrant democracy. Uh, and especially after what happened in Hong Kong, uh, uh, the Japanese you know, want to kind of value uh, Taiwan democracy. Uh, and and uh, one of the sharp criticisms that we've gotten from this report is that uh, our report doesn't talk about that, about, about how we need to support Taiwan's democracy. And, and maybe we should have uh, put something in, uh, in there. And I think what we would have said is that the best way to support Taiwan democracy is to avoid war. Uh, and, and so yeah. therefore, if you love Taiwan's democracy, then Japan should do more to prevent uh, uh, war. Uh, and so uh, I think we were remiss in, in, in making that statement. But that, that's w what my personal position is on that. So, so I think democracy is a, is a big part of it. On supply chains, uh, I, I think there is a consensus that Japan should not be over-dependent on China on supply chains. So they're all for diversification. Uh, they started to move on the diversification uh, after uh, there were suspicions that China uh, was uh, stopping the flow of, 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 of rare earth uh, uh, of minerals to uh, uh, Japan uh, in 2010 during the, the Senkaku uh, uh, crisis. And so Japan has been moving towards diversification uh, already. Uh, and so I think they embrace kind of the European version of de-risking. Uh, I, I wish the Japanese had pushed that concept uh, uh, before the Europeans. Uh, but I think there was a consensus on this de-risking. De uh, but there is opposition to this notion of decoupling. Uh, and so the big question for the Japanese is, uh, how extensive are the American efforts to restrict the flow of technology with China? Uh, and so there was a lot of concern about that. So far, the Japanese uh, have said, well, it's not that bad, uh, but they're worried that it could get worse. So for example, in the semiconductors, on some of the restrictions, uh, uh, Japan's semiconductor industry has really fallen behind. I mean, it used to be at the very top, but it's fallen behind over the uh, last 20 to 30 years. So, so the Netherlands, Ta uh, Taiwan is, is, is ahead. And so some of the restrictions really are not uh, 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 that onerous for the Japanese. In fact, the, uh, the Japanese were concerned that uh, they needed to show that Americans that they were falling into line, and so they had to restrict some of the things which aren't that high tech because that's all they had. <laughs> uh, 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 so, but if the United States, you know, goes beyond this notion of kind of, of what's Jake Sullivan's term is, is kind of a small yard with high fences, you know, if, if the yard gets bigger uh, and, and the fences still remain high, you know, then uh, Japan uh, will be worried. And, and if that's the case, then uh, you know, Japan should work with other middle powers, like South Korea, uh, to resist uh, that. Um, okay, well, I'll take the liberty to ask the final question here. Uh, we've made you work for your uh, lunch. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we actually had a fascinating uh, lecture about uh, Russia, U.S.-Russia relations, the future of world order, and I have to wonder... You know, you talked about uh, clearly the Ukraine war has had a huge impact on uh, on Japan's defense. But I, how is Russia playing into this um, set of rivalries that are developing uh, very uh, quickly? Yeah. So, uh, you know, for, first of all, I mean, although I, I've been critical about Abe for uh, many reasons, uh, one of the things that I admired him uh, for doing is, is is persistence in in trying to finalize a peace treaty uh, with Russia. And, and he would often boast that of, of, all, of any leader in the democratic world, he has had more one-on-one -on -one summit meetings with Vladimir uh, Putin. And he even invited Vladimir Putin uh, to his home uh, prefecture, uh, you know, laid out uh, every, uh, you know, uh, the great hospitality uh, to try to achieve uh, what is a two-island-plus-alpha kind of settlement. Uh, and 
I think what dislodged this, I think they were close, uh, but after Crimea, it became much more difficult, but he still uh, continued to persist. Uh, and Abe was able to get away with it because mm. I think the United States could not stop this effort because Abe had been so important in strengthening the U.S.-Japan alliance. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, you know, after uh, Prime Minister uh, Abe's death, uh, there's no one that can do that. And uh, Kishida uh, has had to embrace uh, uh, NATO uh, on Ukraine. But nevertheless, uh, even Kishida has not ended uh, the energy cooperation projects with Russia. Hmm. I mean, it's just below the radar. Uh, and um, uh, the, the official position of the Japanese government, it is, it is still willing to talk with Russia for uh, a peace treaty negotiation. And so what has ended the, the diplomacy is on the Russia side because uh, Putin was so angry at Japan uh, that it fo fell in line with the U.S. and NATO uh, uh, policy. But uh, Japan is still trying to maintain this thread uh, that, that maybe in the future can be used. So, so definitely uh, uh, Japan hopes that the war will come to an end and that Russia will be brought in some way back into the world community, um, uh, which I think is a, is a different kind of position uh, than the U.S. position. Hmm. Okay, well, please join me in thanking uh, Mike Muchizuki for amazing uh, discussion. <laughs>